idealism prevails. Make the world a better place. Hello and welcome to our podcast here at WIPEC. Since our last podcast, the situation in Ukraine has changed, but not for the better. Russian troops are making progress and Ukraine starts lacking weapons and ammunition to defend itself. As always, I welcome political scientist Professor Gerhard Mangot. Good morning. Good morning. And my colleague uh, Alexander Stipsitz. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let's start with the situation on the ground in the east. Uh, in the last weeks, I started watching the Austrian Military Academy's uh, strategic analysis. I guess you know them. Um, they are quite, quite good, in my opinion. They're making it in German and English. And from there, I learned, for example, that the front is already more than 1,000 kilometers long now. But at the moment, all eyes are on the battle in Sievier uh, Donetsk. Uh, what is so special about the city and how it is, is the situation right now? What can you tell us? Well, actually, if the Russians uh, would manage to uh, get hold of uh, the whole of Severodonetsk and also the neighboring city of Lysychansk, they will be able to actually isolate uh, thousands of Ukrainian troops, which they could actually then um, not just uh, take uh, as prisoners, but they would simply kill them to weaken the Ukrainian Ukrainian side. And if uh, the Russians succeed with uh, uh, getting control over these two cities, almost the whole of the Luhansk province of Ukraine will be under Russian control. So uh, about 80% of the Donbass, which is made up by the two provinces, Donetsk and Luhansk, will be under, under Russian military occupation. And uh, just 20% of the territory left in the province of Donetsk for the Russians to conquer. So this is a crucial week, I think, that we are in now, because the battle over Severodonetsk will be decided this week, or maybe in the next 10 days. And then the assault on uh, Lysychansk will uh, take place. And if the Russians, as I've said, manage to uh, defeat the Ukrainian army in both cities, they will be in a perfect position to get on with uh, conquering the rest of the Donbass. May I come in here? You, Chris, you've mentioned it in your opening statement. Um, loads of weapons were promised. We have seen very clearly in the beginning uh, of this war that whenever drones and, and certain uh, intelligent equipment uh, was employed, that the Ukrainians defended themselves very well and actually made gains. Where are we at now? It, it's very hard for me to gauge what is, what is propaganda and what is real now. Do you have any information as to how the supply situation is and whether the promises are being kept or not? Well, they had a lot of promises, but uh, many of the Western actors that promised military equipment to Ukraine have not lived up to their promise, at least not to the extent uh, they, they had promised uh, initially. And uh, what we also see is that what will be delivered is, go, is getting to Ukraine only very, very slowly. So in the current situation, in the fighting in the Donbass, Ukrainian artillery is much weaker than the Russian one. And uh, the Russians do have long range artillery that they are using to shell uh, cities in the Donbass, whereas the Ukrainians have only limited artillery, artillery capacity and uh, a lack of ammunition, uh, which causes also lack of morale in parts of the Ukrainian uh, army. And uh, this is actually the reason why the Russians have gained uh, territory over the past two months, uh, not very quickly, but steadily. Uh, may, I, may I just add on mm -hmm. to this, you just mentioned the morale. Could you give us a brief update as to, as far as you know, uh, about the Ukrainian forces and, and what the situation psychologically is? Uh, there have been renewed attacks on Kiev. Um, and there, there is, you know, there's rumors of really uh, very high casualties uh, on both sides, uh, uh, partly the numbers that I keep hearing uh, in, in, in the, the hundreds to thousands a day, which is incredibly high uh, for war in the 21st century. So uh, could you give us an update as to casualties and morale? Well, according to uh, Ukrainian official, uh, officials, uh, we have up to 200 dead 
Ukrainian soldiers per day, and that's of course a horrific number. And they can expect that uh, something similar, maybe a bit lower, uh, also on the Russian side. So we have a lot of uh, casualties every day in this uh, war of attrition. What we have seen uh, on uh, social media over the past six weeks is more and more videos from Ukrainian units on the front line who actually ask the president to uh, allow them to withdraw because they are uh, not in a position due to a lack of weaponry and ammunition to resist the Russian onslaught. And uh, they argue that they don't want to desert, but they say they don't get the, the weapons needed to continue fighting and they simply uh, don't want to be sent by the Ukrainian leadership into a meat grinder, as they put mm -hmm. it. So yes, there is a, um, a decrease in morale on the Ukrainian side, which is of course also caused by uh, the lack of success against the Russian side, particularly in the Donbass. We have some success on uh, of the Ukrainian army in the south of, of the country, uh, in the vicinity of the city of Kherson. Um, but uh, in the Donbass, they are actually on the losing side, at least for the moment, and that, of course, undermines morale. Um, but we also can expect that we have morale problems on the Russian side as well. We do have reports that uh, units uh, don't want to implement orders by their officers, uh, that they rebel against the, uh, the, uh, the uh, orders by the officers. And... Um, the longer the war goes, the more it will be a war of attrition. This uh, decrease in morale will be uh, becoming more and more important for both sides. If you compare, I think in, in Afghanistan, Russians lost all over the war 18,000 soldiers. About and 15, I think 15, even less. 15, and, about 15,000. And um, now they already probably lost as much in like three months. So, yes, the, the casualty figures are enormously yeah, high. Yeah. Uh, which, of course, also uh, undermines morale on the Russian side. And uh, the heavy casualties that the Russians took, particularly in the initial six to eight weeks, was particularly due to poor planning, mm. uh, pure implementation of, uh, of battle plans. Uh, in the past two months, uh, the Russians have changed their tactics. They are now using long-range artillery to shell Ukrainian positions uh, and cities and only when they have actually caused a great number of casualties on the Ukrainian side, it destroyed a lot of Ukrainian equipment, they move forward with their infantry. Uh, and this new strategy, of course, is trying to, to lower the number of casualties on the Russian side, because at the end of the day, if uh, the initial losses mm -hmm. had continued uh, for the whole four months that we have this war now, the Russians would have a serious lack of infantry. And uh, that is something that... Uh, they cannot cope with unless there's a general mobilization by the Russian leadership. Mm. But um, Putin is hesitant to call for a general mobilization. And, and course, I don't yeah. expect it in the forthcoming weeks. Um, uh, yes. So, sorry, pardon. I've got a little hailstorm coming down outside my window. It's not a Russian attack yet. Um, uh, that's a bad joke. Um, let me ask you, Zelensky said that until August, he's not planning to hold any negotiations with the Russians. Uh, General Petreozov, ex-general in, in America yesterday said, despite the analysis which he gave pretty much as you just did of a, a prolonged war that we can see now, he still gives the Ukrainians the upper hand potentially um, due to them defending their own country. Um, how? How do you see, um, it's hard to say, of course, but how do you see the, the progression now? Uh, there are rumors that the Ukrainians are preparing for a counterattack coming up from the southwest, um, you know, to put pressure up there. Or can we, or, or could we speculate that the original plan of cutting off uh, Luhansk uh, and, and Donbass is actually going to be where we are going to touch down in August? Uh, and then start negotiations. I know this is speculation, but let's go there. Well, Zelensky has uh, frequently announced counteroffensives, and he uh, has said that we will do so if we get all the weaponry and ammunition promised by Western countries. And uh, he uh, even said these, that these counteroffensives will, given the Western military uh, support, be uh, quite successful, and they will be able to push back the Russian forces in the Donbass. 
and then from a strengthened negotiated negotiation position they will enter into talks with the russians if the russians are ready to talk uh, with with the ukrainian side uh, this these are very optimistic prognoses uh, some military experts don't believe that the ukrainians will be in a position to launch counter uh, offensives because it's much easier of course to defend territory than to reoccupy, to regain control of occupied territory. So this will be a huge challenge for the Ukrainian army, even with Western military support. But I'm not a military expert, expert so let's wait and see if they uh, indeed will launch such offensives and if they indeed will be successful. Uh, but as you've said, uh, the Ukrainians do not only focus on the Donbass, of course, that's, that's the, 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 the main region where, where they try to stop the Russian onslaught, but they also fight against uh, Russian forces in the south, um, trying to regain control of Kherson, the city of the Kherson region in, in Ukraine's south. So they will not actually engage just on one front line, but on two or more. Uh, to uh, force the Russians to disperse their forces and to be unable to continue concentrating most of their soldiers uh, on the fighting in the Donbass. Uh, since a few weeks, President Zelensky claims that Ukraine will retake all occupied territories, including Crimea. Is this foremost to put pressure on the West to deliver the heavy weaponry faster, especially faster? or to boost Ukrain, Ukrainian morale? And does he really believe that this is possible? Or is this just to boost its, uh, the morale of the army? Well, Zelensky has frequently uh, changed his position. Uh, for uh, quite a, a couple of times, he said, our goal is to restore the front line at the status quo ante. So uh, the front line where it was before Russia launched uh, this invasion. Then uh, um, the next day, he says, no, we want to liberate all the territory from Ukrainian, uh, from Russian, sorry, forces, which of course would mean uh, reconquering the separatist regions in the southeast, and of course Crimea and Sevastopol, the port city on the Crimean Peninsula. Um, well, um, this also indicates that Zelensky probably is under pressure uh, within the political elite of Ukraine, uh, what the war goals should be. And actually, um, this back and forth of Zelensky with regard to maximalist or minimalist uh, war goals also is reflected in the West. We have an emerging cleavage in the West among the camp that is called the peace camp, which wants to have uh, um, a truce and uh, negotiations about peace uh, as soon as possible. And the so-called justice camp, which uh, supports Ukraine's ambitions to defeat the Russians fully, uh, to kick them out uh, of all of Ukraine. And uh, the latter camp uh, uh, so uh, supports uh, Zelensky's ambitions to reconquer all of the Ukrainian territory, everything that was lost since 2014. And these countries are Poland, the Baltic nations, Romania, the British, but also the US, whereas uh, the German, the French, and the Italian governments, and some other Western European governments actually do not think that such such a maximalist strategy, such maximalist goals actually are conducive uh, for restoring uh, peace because they think that if the Ukrainians, if they are able to, of course, if the Ukrainians were to attack Crimea, to kick the Russians out from there or the initial separatist regions, Russia will uh, seriously escalate the fighting with, with the introduction of new weapons, which might also include tactical nuclear weapons. So this is a cleavage that we have in the West between uh, those who support maximalist goals and those who want to, uh, uh, to limit Ukraine's war goals. And this, uh, you know, this uh, cleavage or this, uh, this dividing line we also have in the Ukrainian leadership, and we will see how it, how it will play out. Uh, you just mentioned Europe. Let's go there, please. Um, the France, you just mentioned France, where the conservative middle of the road forces just suffered a pretty devastating defeat uh, to the right and the left wing. Um, this will, in my humble opinion, have an impact on the position that France will take in the future um, on Russia. 
Um, and I, as you said, there are those two camps that are forming. Can we, maybe maybe we can stay there a little bit because I think this has a tremendous impact. Um, so so there, there are, I wouldn't say even pro-Russian, but some apologetic voices are starting to appear. One of which surprised me, which is the Pope who came out last week and said, well, you know, uh, some government leader has told him um, the NATO was rather provocative. Uh, before that war. Um, I find this interesting. Um, do you think this is because Europe is and the rest of the world seriously beginning to suffer also from the energy situation and uh, is afraid of Putin who just uh, likened himself to Peter the Great and has threatened Kazakhstan? I, I mean, what I mean, the, the simple question is, are we not going to pull back uh, the whole world and say justice is not important um, so much. Uh, we, we just try to make peace now because Putin will go on and he will keep uh, um, fighting against the West. Well, the Europeans are feeling the heat of the war, of course, the, the consequences of the war, which has increased inflation in, in, uh, in Western economies, which had been on the rise already before the war. But by the war, inflation is now even higher, given uh, uh, a rise in food prices, and particularly the rise uh, in, in the price of energy carriers, oil and gas particularly. Uh, so uh, Western societies actually will come under stress um, um, people uh, will ask in all or in most of uh, the Western countries will ask, uh, uh, should we really accept these uh, financial and social costs in our countries just because our political uh, elite's ambition is to support Ukraine against uh, Russia's aggression. So I think these voices will become louder and the governments will have to respond. And this will be particularly true if uh, Russians cut the gas supplies to uh, European Union countries, which will cause a lot of economic and uh, financial friction and uh, increase inflation even further. Russia's decision to block Ukrainian grain exports and to lower the Russian grain exports will increase food prices uh, internationally. And this will lead to a situation where some countries, particularly African countries, will not be able to feed their population, which might cause a new wave of refugees, which will, of course, also flee and migrate to the European Union, which will put even more stress on these uh, political systems and societies. So I do think there is a deliberate strategy on the Russian side to do everything they can to undermine the coherence and cohesion of Western societies in order to, in order to um, make the governments of the EU and Western countries to rethink their strong commitment to the defense of Ukraine. Uh, I do think that this is a deliberate strategy. And what we, what we can see in many countries, of course, is already what we can call the Ukraine war fatigue. Uh, this war now lasts for almost four months. And uh, it's still as brutal as it was from the very start, but people, I do have anecdotal evidence and some opinion polls, are getting tired to see these pictures, particularly if the war will become a very long war as uh, uh, NATO General Secretary Stoltenberg has indicated, or British Prime Minister Johnson has indicated over the past days, even uh, if this will be a long war, a war of attrition, which will last many months, maybe even years. I do think that this Ukraine fatigue in the West will increase and will, it, will make it more difficult for the governments to continue with their efforts to support Ukraine in this war. Uh, concerning migration, we have already seen that the numbers are going up. As I heard yesterday that we already have more uh, migra migrants in Austria now than we had uh, one year ago coming over the Balkan route uh, with, with the grain. Of course, we've already, I've already read that Russia sent one of their ships to uh, Africa, now telling the people, of course, Vladimir Putin is bringing you grain. So he will gain population, uh, popularity there, of course. And with gas, we've seen already now that, especially the three countries that have been to Kiev last week, and namely France, Germany, and and Italy uh, are now getting reduced uh, gas deliveries. 
uh, for the last point, uh, is this uh, definitely no technical issue that Russia is claiming or, or is it uh, a mixture or is it already politics from Putin that the gas is not delivered? Well, a technical difficulties may play a very minor role, but the major reason, of course, for the uh, cut of gas supplies or the diminishing volume of Russian gas supplies to European countries, particularly to the three European countries you mentioned, uh, is, is deliberate uh, and is, uh, is uh, an arbitrary move. Uh, what he wants to send to these countries is that if we cut off the gas, uh, your economies will face, particularly the German and the Italian or Austrian economy for that matter, will face serious difficulties. Uh, with sending less gas now, he's making more difficult uh, for European nations, including Austria, to fill uh, their gas storage sites, which would help them to survive the winter, even if Russia cuts off all of the gas uh, in the fall or early winter. Uh, and so th this, this, this goal of uh, European governments to have full storage capacity will, of course, be uh, not achieved if the Russians uh, continue to deliver only so small volumes of gas or even less. On the other hand, I have to say, uh, not taking the side of Russia, of course, but let, let's have a very uh, distant and objective look at the matter. The European Union has prepared and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, also implemented six sanctions packages against Russia which do have enormous impact on the Russian economy, the social sector and the social sphere, or the financial sector and the social sphere. So what we see is now Russia simply retaliating. This is what they can do with energy carrier deliveries. That's what they can particularly do with gas. So in a sense, uh, the Russians are just, uh, uh, as I've said, retaliating for Western action. And that is also something that uh, will have to be answered by the political class in Europe. Are we ready to uh, accept serious difficulties, economic, financial and social, um, if the Russians cut off gas supplies because we want to support Ukraine against Russia's aggression? Or will we see a, a rethinking in some of the European governments that um, no more sanctions should be, uh, should be uh, adopted no more sanctions should be implemented in order to, to prevent the Russian side from, from cutting off all the gas deliveries. But then again, you have those who say that's appeasement and that's something that is actually uh, unacceptable for Western democratic societies. But, um, well, leaving all that moral talk aside, I, I'm eager to see how this will change the calculus of European governments over the next uh, weeks and months. Well, last week, the calculus was, uh, let's put Ukraine on a fast track to membership. Um, how clever that was, uh, I, I leave to others to decide. I don't think it was particularly clever. Um, but may I, I, I if, you, if you allow me, I, I, have a, I, I would like to take this a little bit to, to a meta stage. China came out, I think, at the beginning of last week to say that it would cooperate and assist Russia in um, global security matters, which, um, which chills me a little bit. Then was the threat against Kazakhstan, I repeat it, then the, then the uh, celebrations of I think 300 years Peter the Great, uh, and Putin coming out yesterday or the day, the day before yesterday saying the, we, we are seeing the end of a unipolar world, by which he means a world apparently dominated by uh, US um, military and political uh, economic interests. Is there a situation where we are on a larger scale now seeing such a move that at the end of the day, the whole thing is China, Russia and the pro or less democratic forces in the world leaning against the US heavily? Well, the Russians have started to promote this uh, model of multipolarity already in the late 1990s. And uh, since then, this was one of the most ambitious goals of uh, Russian foreign policy. Now they no, no longer call it multipolar, but polycentric, which is essentially the same. The question, however, is will the Russians actually remain strong enough 
uh, to be a pole in such a multipolar setting, or, or will we not see a new bipolar order emerge with uh, the US and China facing each other on, uh, on different sides of the barricades and Russia will simply be a junior partner in supporting China uh, in this confrontation and the European Union will be a junior partner of the United States in, in this confrontation. So we cannot be sure that the multipolar order will emerge or whether it will, uh, it will actually persist for a while if it will not turn very quickly into a bipolar order. But of course, for the Russia, uh, for Russia, the Chinese political and diplomatic support is essential. Uh, but what would be essential for the Russians as well, and what they have asked for is Chinese economic and financial support. And uh, this expectation that China will come up with, uh, with uh, support, which will mitigate the consequences of Western sanctions, this uh, expectation actually turns out to be illusionary because uh, Ukraine, uh, sorry, Chinese companies don't want to get sanctions pressure from, from the United States, secondary sanctions by the United States, if they violate the, the sanctions uh, adopted by, by the West, the European Union and the United States. So Russia is not getting the support economically and financially it actually needs, uh, also not the support that it technologically Need. So in this respect, the partnership between Russia and China has not been very helpful for the Russian side. But as I've said, politically and diplomatically, Chinese uh, support is very welcome in Moscow. Um, may I, Chris? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you see the threats against Kazakhstan, meaning this whole imperialist demeanor? Now, the, the rumors are still on that Putin is sick, that that is still on. Uh, I'm not, I'm, whatever he may have, he's obviously very resilient and bathing in, in the blood of some animals, apparently, or whatever. Uh, but um, he's, he's holding on, and this man is very strong, and I'm actually more afraid that, in case he is sick, that he would get more determined to uh, realize his historical ambitions, which he undoubtedly has. Um, uh, do you expect um, um, the Russian aggression to continue unless uh, an end is put to it uh, now here in the Ukraine? Because I fear that is a possibility. Well, military experts argue that uh, if the Russians will be able to conquer the whole of the Donbass, they will no longer have uh, the weaponry, the ammunition, and particularly the soldiers to launch further offensives mm -hmm. in Ukraine, maybe pushing to the, uh, the river Dnieper, uh, or even uh, launch an offensive against Nikolaev or Odessa. Mm -hmm. Well, if that is true, and I have no doubt that it is indeed true, uh, Russia will not be able actually in the, in the next years, maybe in the next decade, to launch any other military invasions or interventions in its neighborhood. But we have clearly seen that uh, Putin is comparing himself to Peter the Great, Pyotr Veliki, uh, and argues that uh, Peter the Great has not actually uh, wanted to seize territory from other countries, but he argues, Putin argues, that Peter the Great simply wanted to return territories which had always belonged to Russia. And that's actually, as he continued, what the Russian state is up to now, namely to regain control over historic Russia. And this, of course, does not only include parts of Ukraine or even the whole of Ukraine, but other parts in Russia's neighborhood as well. But the military capacity to launch uh, such uh, uh, interventions in the next 10 to 15 years will be uh, very limited, if not at all too small, too weak, to carry out such a neo-imperialist agenda beyond Ukraine. Maybe, maybe he waits for China to start the quarrel about Taiwan and then uh, picks up his own uh, his own agenda. But this maybe take more five to ten more years, and we don't know if he will be around then. Yeah. Well, Russia would definitely profit if China now decided to launch a, 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 an assault on, on Taiwan because this would open a second front for the West. Uh, but it's highly unlikely that China wants to do so and will do so. If they had the intention to use this uh, crisis in, in Europe uh, as a pretext for causing a crisis in East Asia, then they would have done so already uh, almost immediately after the start of the Ukrainian war. The US has signaled to China that um, at least Biden has done so three times in a row now, 
uh, that in case of an unprovoked military aggression by China against Taiwan, they will uh, militarily assist Taiwan, not just with weaponry and ammunition, but they would send US soldiers to help defend Taiwan. Um, well, uh, the team around Biden has uh, tried hard to argue that, no, we have not changed our Taiwan policy, which had been uh, till now a policy of strategic ambiguity, meaning that the US left it open, whether in case of an unprovoked military assault by China on Taiwan, they would come to the uh, defense of Taiwan or not. Um, some say we now need a strategy of uh, clarity. We need to send a clear signal to China that we will uh, uh, enter US forces to defend Taiwan against Chinese military aggression. And if this is indeed taking place, such a change in policy from a strategy of ambiguity to a strategy of clarity, then of course the Chinese will be even more hesitant to launch such uh, a military intervention on the peninsula, however, uh, on, on the island of Taiwan, sorry. Um, but if the Taiwanese, which uh, the US rejects, of course, uh, declare independence, then uh, this would definitely cause a military chain reaction and a Chinese military assault on Taiwan. But I don't think that will be on the agenda for the next years to come. As it has been called already a few times, the um, we are now talking about the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, let's talk about it a little bit. This is very fascinating to me, uh, uh, what is going on in the US that is increasingly, again, divided. Um, we have the hearings uh, concerning the sedition uh, or the attempted sedition, the 6th of January is becoming apparently clear. Uh, that the former President Trump actually did what we all suspected, uh, which I, I think people are not really here understanding what that actually means. I, I think in America neither. So let me ask, this has an impact, I think, on the on, on the whole Ukraine situation and, and everything. Um, I hear from you that you take the US very seriously and that China apparently is also taking it seriously in the sense that militarily there's still the might that they are. Um, but we are having elections again, presidential elections in two years plus. Uh, and, and should somebody like Trump come in again, uh, this would change tremendously uh, what goes on in this situation also with Putin. Should Putin be around or anyone following him who is of like mind? Um, is the US currently being underestimated? I mean that in the sense of its deep inner coherence um, as, a, as a military force for what we call democracy. Are there not many that are saying, that are seeing the weakness, the apparent weakness of Biden, which is almost sadly comical? Um, and, and is that not something that, that, that is provoking, um, uh, certainly also to appoint uh, Putin and certain also forces uh, in Europe, um, to, yeah, to make the mistake or to dare to challenge the U.S. more than would otherwise be the case with a strong leadership? Well, the United States uh, political system is still quite dysfunctional and uh, the political uh, situation is quite polarized in the United States and will remain so in the coming years. Biden is already weak, particularly by the economic uh, and social situation in the United States with record high inflation rates that the U.S. has not seen for the past 40 years. And of course, this causes discontent and unease in the US society. And Biden will get weaker as a consequence when he will lose the midterm elections to the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, to parts of the Senate and the House of Representatives in November of this year, which might result in uh, uh, Republican majorities in both houses of Congress. Uh, and uh, such a weakened president uh, actually will maybe lose the support of his party, the Democratic Party, to run for a second term in 2024. And it's very likely that in 20, or well, it's likely, not very likely, it's likely that in 2024, we will see Trump or a Trump-like candidate regain the White House for the Republicans. And if you will see this America first strategy that Trump has, has pursued uh, with the next president of the United States, then of course this will have an impact on the commitments of the US to Europe, to the European security, and maybe also to Ukraine. 
On the other hand, at the moment at least, we have to say that there is bipartisan support for strong backing of Ukraine, for strong military and financial support of Ukraine. Congress has authorized uh, more than 50 billion US dollars in military and humanitarian and financial aid for Ukraine. So uh, at the moment at least, uh, both parties are in support of uh, such active US uh, interference in this, in this war. Uh, but it might change over, over uh, the next months and, and years, and it might definitely change if we will have uh, America first, uh, make America great again, president again in 2024. If not Trump, then maybe somebody of, from his clan, yeah? Yes. Quite possibly, yeah. Um, I have one last question, also with a, from the global view. The Wall Street Journal last week or two weeks ago wrote that India is buying Russian oil uh, to a cheap price and then refining it and selling it uh, to Europe with a premium. Uh, so they are not really supporting the sanctions at all. China, of course, never imported as much Russian oil as in May 2022, as we just read today. We had in St. Petersburg last week uh, an economic summit with over 70 countries participating. So it seems that outside of NATO and Europe, the support for the sanctions and also for Austin, Vladimir Putin is not really strong. So maybe do we, do our, does our media, does our politi do our politicians realize this? That well, there is definitely a division in the world and is not everybody against Putin? Well, Russia is definitely isolated by the, the political West or the collective West, if you may call it this way. Uh, but as you said, uh, the world is much bigger than the West, and sometimes the West thinks uh, uh, the West still dominates uh, the international uh, uh, order. There are other countries who have divergent views and different views. Uh, there are uh, China and India, of course, who are backing the Russian side, or at least the Indians not, uh, not condemning the Russian aggression in Ukraine and trying to make economic and financial profit of the new situation by buying cheap Russian energy carriers such as coal and oil. We have uh, quite many African countries who have uh, uh, abstained during the vote in the United Nations General Assembly on condemning the Russian invasion. Um, they have not actually condemned Russia uh, and they, they have not imposed sanctions. A NATO country like Turkey has not imposed sanctions. Israel has not imposed sanctions. There are many Arab countries, particularly the Gulf monarchies, uh, who have uh, resisted Western pressure to condemn Russia's actions. And this is true also for some Asian nations beyond India and China. And this is also true for some Latin, Latin American countries. So rise, Russia is not isolated uh, globally. It's isolated by the West. Of course, Western sanctions uh, hurt Russia most, e even if some other fringe countries would impose sanctions on Russia as well. Uh, their sanctions wouldn't have such an impact on the Russian economy and its financial sector. So the Russians are feeling the heat by Western sanctions and Western political isolation efforts uh, but they are not isolated globally, and they try to uh, to um, find new export markets for their production all over the globe, beyond the Western perimeter. And uh, they also seek uh, other suppliers of goods and services and even technologies uh, to Russia from other countries, such as China, India, and, and several others. Thank you. Uh, I may, for my last question, I would like to return to, to Europe and especially to, to Russia, which I consider in a way to at least be a part of the European continent. Um, what do you hear from Russia? In the beginning, we've been speculating, not we, but it has been speculated um, that the Russian people, you know, will not, you know, hold this. They will uh, oppose Putin and his regime. Um, I hear occasionally something in that direction, but very, very mildly. Uh, Navalny has been moved to a location unknown. The only real threat Putin has ever had, as far as I uh, can see. How, what do you hear from inside Russia is the question. And then I tag on, what do you hear from the inside of the Ukraine 
um, as to you know fatigue of the situation and looking for a way out on well a majority of the russian population is still backing and supporting this uh, special military operations uh, as the russians prefer to call it this spetsoperatsia for various reasons some indeed support the geopolitical ambitions of the, the russian leadership others actually uh, are politically apathetic and simply accept that this war is now happening others uh, vary about the war, but they think Putin will probably know why he has launched this this war. Maybe he knows something that we do not know. So we can uh, still say that the majority of the Russians are not opposed to this war, to put it more, more carefully. Uh, the, 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 the number of Russians which is opposed to the war, wants to end it, and wants to get rid of Vladimir Putin, is just a minority of uh, young, urban, middle class, people in the large cities of uh, Russia, particularly in Moscow and, and St. Petersburg. So um, Putin and the leadership has, not, has nothing to fear from the society, no backlash from uh, anti-war sentiments by a majority of Russians, which of course is very helpful. And this has also been, this support has also been maintained because Putin has been able to say, this is not just a, a military operation that we are launching as, against Ukrainian Nazis, but this is a war that the West has opened against Russia. Uh, the West wants to defeat Russia, the West wants to humiliate Russia, the West even wants to disband Russia and to make it uh, separate into different political entities. So when Putin is able to, to tell uh, his population that actually we, in, we are in a war with the West, and the people in Russia feeling the impact of Western sanctions, then this rallying around the flag effect is a demonstration of solidarity between the majority of the society and the Russian leadership will continue for a while. Thank you. Uh, I have to tag one little question on, is that okay? Um, when I heard that the Pope had begun to be apologetic, um, that was a little bit weird, but then I looked at it again and I thought, if you look at those forces which seem to understand Putin better than others, uh, the more extreme left, the more extreme right, and the countries that you've mentioned, uh, then I would say those are all forces that are not all that um, keen on what we call liberal democracy. Don't we have here at the very bottom of it globally also a severe threat to what we have come to understand after 45 as liberal democracy? Doesn't it seem that uh, whether the gas is there and, and whether the comfort remains and all of that is, has become more important to maybe a majority, I'm not sure yet, of the population, that it's only the political elite in Europe at the moment and some liberals, uh, liberal, liberal Democrats in America that are still holding on to that. Sometimes it seems to me all of those things put together are, um, are countering that what we've become to know as the woke wokeness of the world, all those authoritarian forces ganging up. And I personally uh, am beginning to be a little bit uh, afraid of that uh, is, is is that just uh, is that just my personal feeling or do you see such a trend well the wave of democratization has long ended we have seen the number of democracies uh, on the globe in in decline over the past 14 years so it's definitely uh, the case that uh, in many places uh, authoritarian forces are regaining uh, the upper hand uh, and uh, democracy is sidelined, democratic institutions abolished and authoritarian rule reinstituted. That's definitely, definitely uh, a process that we can observe globally. However, uh, I'm not sure whether we, we should frame uh, the conflict between the West and Russia, the conflict between the West and China as a conflict between democracy and autocracy. Uh, of course, it's true that Russia is a deeply repressive authoritarian system. The same is true for, uh, for China as well, of course. So, of course, they are authoritarians and we in the West have more or less uh, uh, stable liberal democracies uh, without any deficiencies. 
But I think what we, what we see at the moment and what we will see between the West and China are great power rivalries, uh, rivalries about resources, rivalries about influence, rivalries about uh, uh, wealth, uh, about military strength. And um, this debate that we are now, we in the West are now in a, in a process where we have to defend our democracies against autocracies is something like an effort in ideologizing what is essentially a material a great power rivalry between the countries that I've mentioned before. Thank you very much for putting all of this in perspective. I learned some things again. So as always, yeah. Time. Yeah, thank you. So I think we can wrap it up for today. Thank you for participating. Thank, thank, thank you. you for watching and we see you again soon. Idealism prevails. Make the world a better place.